14 Apostles. <laughs> we are kicking off the summer study uh, together. I'm glad y'all are here. This is one that I have, um, I did a version of this one probably 10 years ago for a group of people, and we did it through Google Hangouts. Um, I actually was flying to El Paso one day, and I was doing it in the in the terminal in the airport through my iPad. Um, that was kind of like my first kind of technological deal. Uh, I would despise doing it like that now. I really like the in-person. I like having all of y'all here. I like the interaction and the, the commentary. And Chris brings a lot of great context and, and uh, historical um, facts and stuff for us. And you guys bring great questions and comments. I really like that interaction deal. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm a preacher. A preacher kind of speaks at you. I really feel more like a teacher where I'm speaking with you. And that's just kind of my modus operandi. Okay, so this is the website. Um, it will be redflag.com slash 14 apostles. It will also be available on YouTube. That's how you're watching with us today and you found it on YouTube. Awesome. But there's more context and pictures and maps and stuff that will end up here. Um, we have completed the Genesis study. We went through verse by verse, chapter by chapter through Genesis. Uh, we just finished uh, Exodus where we went verse by verse, chapter by chapter through Exodus. I really loved it. And so now we're going to go and do something a little bit different. We're going to get out of the Old Testament and talk about some New Testament stuff. Um, and we're going to start today with the first century. So 2022 years ago, about. Uh, this is 2022. Uh, about 20, 2002, 2022 years ago, what was life like? Where were these guys, and where did they live, and what did they see, and what did they experience? We're gonna, we're gonna. This is the way I like to explain today's uh, study: is we're gonna set the backdrop and the stage for what the rest of the weeks this summer are gonna. Those are gonna be acts or plays on this stage that we're creating today. So this is kind of setting the the. This is what this is the world where, where this thing is taking place in. Does that make sense? You tracking? Okay. So <clears throat> the first thing is, this is a map showing all the different empires at the time of the first century common era, or we say about Jesus' birth. His birth was actually like 3 BC. But what yes. Watch something like I'll be on YouTube <clears throat> Video when they say CE, what are they, I, mean, I know A, A, B, C, and 80. I went to school. I so, know, so like, you want to say? What is that? Years ago. I'm way, way what better about, when I say that. I feel like I don't know. Common era. But is that a different date? Okay. No. You know how when Jesus was born, and this throws everybody off, it will say, even if you Google it right now, it will say Jesus was born for the CE, okay. before Common Era. Well, how can he be born in the year four, the 4 BC? Why that is, in the year 300 or the 200, the second century, they realized, the Catholics realized, there was a flaw in the Roman calendar. Okay. So in the year 300, they, it, it got moved because it was Jesus was born on year, year one, right? Yeah. Okay. They realized that there was a flaw in the Roman calendar around 300 and changed it to 4 BC. Yeah. But BC and BC. Before so BC was before Christ. AD was uh, Anno Domini, which literally Latin translates to the year of our Lord, being Jesus here, the year of our Lord. And people in the scientific and historical communities didn't want to include Jesus or Christ or God in, in, in it. So they say before the common era, the BCE, or the CE, the common era. So, so they say, oh, this happened in 25 CE. Does that mean it's 25 AD? Yes. Yes. So, okay. So, that's, that's the okay. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the they're rewriting. They're, they're rewriting everything to. Yeah, it means 80. Okay, so yeah, it means 80. Right. Always have to reinvent the wheel. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So, the, the year's the same. 25 CE, yes. 25 CE. Yes. Yes. Right. And this and this is great. That's what today is about. Oh, it's talking about this stuff because I want you to have an idea where we are. OK, so I'm using CE because some people are watching, you know, they're going to get immediately red flags if I say AD or, or whatever. So CE, but AD, right? So it's AD. So this is an image of the approximate boundaries of the different uh, empires that were present 
around 1 AD, 1, 1 CE, okay, 1 in the Common Era. And you can see we've got some here in North Africa. The Roman Empire uh, is wrapped around the Mediterranean here. Uh, there's, there's the Kush Empire down here. You can see, look, this is the Han Empire. Look how big that is. We always say that Rome ruled the world. It was just Rome ruled the, the Western world. I mean, yeah. look at the Han Empire. Way bigger, Way bigger yeah. right? Yeah. Um, well, now, now here's the deal. This is vastly uninhabited. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's nobody. There's no one there. <laughs> there's a lot more people around this area. Okay. So when you talk about they ruled more people, absolutely. When they had a larger empire, no, not correct. Uh, you also see here there's the uh, there's the Aztecs, the Mayas, the Toltecs. Uh, all the different uh, Central American people are starting to make some empires here. This is this is the the Yucatan Peninsula. That's where we have Chichen Itza. That's the pyramids that we have in Mexico. They're building those while Jesus is being born, or his a toddler. Okay, so you, you kind of have an idea of where we are now. I mean, we only look at Western civilization. We really only look at European um, history. And civilization there's a lot more happening here um, that, that's going on this is the the Parthian Empire um, I mean there's all sorts of stuff going on uh, the Hun the uh, the Huns are here and remember they they're fighting uh, with with Rome the um, they, they've already defeated the Carth Carthaginians at this point but they would have been right right here so we, we kind of have this this map showing that there's more going on in the world than just what we're talking about, okay? Uh, and I want you to note here, look, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in India too, right? See all these different empires all the, the way? Huh? The right is Rome? No, well, this one's not Rome. It's, it's a different it's a different red. Oh, no, okay. no, it's just a it's just a different. Okay. They only have like four or five colors, so okay. they reuse that, but that's not Rome. Okay. This is Rome here. Rome in literally Rome ended here. It didn't go out into the deserts, the des the proper deserts. It stayed in the Mediterranean deserts of Israel, and then along the Nile River here, Africa, and North Africa, Carthage, Algeria, uh, Libya, all that kind of stuff. So this gives us an idea. <clears throat> Jesus. Hey, what's in the dark blue? Here. That's the uh, Parthian Empire. Okay. The reason I ask you, I, you know, Paul's missions, mm -hmm. we're kind of just trying to figure his, his, his mission. Right. So, yeah. So, we see right after uh, Jesus is in, in Acts, we see, um, who is it? Peter? I can't remember. I can't remember who it was. But he was immediately, he was with the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip. Philip. It was yes. Philip. Yes. Yeah. Philip was with the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, the Ethiopian eunuch would be somebody from, from down in here in this, this region. This is where Ethiopia is, down in here in this area. So that, that person would have been coming out of Israel on the road, coming down this direction to go home. So where were they going to? Well, there was other stuff happening in the world. Is that making sense? Like it wasn't just some guy, I'm going out to Ethiopia. I'm the only person there. Like, I'm, you know, there's other people living. There's other people. There's civilizations that are growing around. And when we see here that the the Silk Road, we weren't calling it, Marco Polo named it that later. Uh, when was Marco Polo, Chris? That was in the 1500s. It was like not till the 14, 15, 1600s, somewhere in there. So, you know, we're talking 1,500 years after this, okay? So you can imagine how much these have expanded and grown and other ones popped up and other ones, you know, have gone away or whatever in 1,500 years. But... All that being said, the Silk Road was already here. They were already bringing spices and silk across through here, through through this pathway here. They came on the south side of the Himalayas. The north side of the Himalayas, this spot right here, the reason that's blank, that's actually still blank today. There's, I think there was something like a thousand people that lived in that vast region right there because it's so high altitude, so dry, so desolate. And as a matter of fact, air, airplanes, when you look at air traffic, it goes around this zone still today. Tibet, which is the ceiling of the world. 
pretty cool place. Yeah. Hey, I was doing this research this week. I didn't mean to go there, but it was talking about the weather during mm. this period. Mm. The weather in Rome mm. uh, during this time of Christ. The weather was a little cooler than it is now. And they think it was because they were, they were closer to the last ice age. Yeah. Which is like 10,000 years ago. So they were closer to the ice melt. The, so the earth was cooler a little bit than we have it right now. And we actually have... Um, in in the, the the Sahara up here, we actually have whale fossils, yes. yeah, exactly. and there are palm trees and signs that there was plant life and stuff. So that tells you it was probably cooler. And if it was cooler, then water didn't evaporate as fast. And if water didn't evaporate as fast, then you can more it's more greenery. Yeah. Okay, so we cool. We ready to, to move forward? I mean, you kind of have an idea now where we're at, what we're doing. Oh, one other thing I wanted to talk about. That's what that's what it was. I kept pointing to it, and we got just distracted. But that's why we're here is this area over here, going all the way back to our Genesis study, all of this area over here is Ham of Noah's sons, Ham, okay? This area here is a mixture of Ham and Japheth. Remember, there were some of the Japheth that went over here, okay? This area right in here is Shem, and this is where you have the breakdown from Isaac and Ishmael's lineages. Ishmael's lineages are the Arabs. Isaac's lineage is the Jews. Okay? And they're, they're basically in this area here. And then you have the, the Egyptians and the Kush. These are all Ham here. All of these up here are going to be Japheth. And this over here is Ham. And it's, it's, you can barely even see it, but here, like Machu Picchu is even on here. Okay? And so that's, that's Ham as well. So we have the three sons of Noah. But anyway, my whole point of bringing that all back again is uh, that we see Israel. Israel is the crossroads of the world at that time. I mean, it still is for the majority of the population when you look at it from that perspective, too. Uh, because you've got the connection with the Silk Road going to the east. You've got Japheth coming here, and you've got Ham effectively coming here. And so Shem, the line of Jesus, comes through the line of Shem. And so you have Jesus bringing the brothers back together at the central location where God promised to set up. Mm -hmm. So when you look at geography, the geography of the Bible, it is important for us to have an understanding of where these things are taking place because I think it lends itself to, um, to give us more context as to what was the purpose. Why Jesus? Why did he come at this time? Why did he come at this location? Why didn't he come when they were enslaved in Egypt? Right? Well, when he comes now, he brings, this is already unified land, unified language, unified culture. They have architecture. They have uh, transportation. The, the Roman roads are still in existence. people to teach to, and these people were civilized. They were under law. There was other places in the world like where you don't have. They weren't under law. There were no laws. How right. You teach the people like that. Right. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, you're right. So that's the geography. This just to zoom in, you can see here the Parthian Empire. Uh, it's cleaner on this image here. The Germanic tribes are up here. The Sar Sar Sarmarians. The... I can't read it. Anyway. You get the point. We got a lot of stuff happening here. It's not just Rome. It's not just what we see in the Bible. The Bible is not written to cover. It doesn't necessarily cover all the activity of all the people of all the planet. We know there are the beginnings where that happens. We know the the table of nations where uh, he talks about, well, these people went this place, and these people went this place, and these people went this place. We know that. We talked about that during Genesis. But... What we are focusing on is Jesus and his interaction in this sphere, okay? We're not talking about everything else, but you need to know that it exists, okay? This is a bar chart overlaying the different um, activities that are going on, uh, the, history, the historical ages, through the different um, regions of the planet. So in Southwest Asia, you have Mesopotamia, Elam, Acacia, uh, I mean, our Archimedes Empire. And so as we go across the bottom, uh, let's see here. Yeah, there we go. So as we go across the bottom here, here's 3000 BC or BCE. 
And here's zero. This is where Christ is coming in, right? They're here. And you have 1000 AD or 1000 CE, common era. And you can see all of this activity is happening before we even come to Christ entering in onto the planet. Now, we know that from Genesis study, that they were spread out across the planet. But it's, it's interesting for us to take note. I mean, the Indus Valley civilization in India, that's happening. 3,000 years up to here to, what is that? 900, 1100, 1100. So 3,000 to 1100. This whole civilization lived and then died. Okay, so there is great history, and Paul in particular utilizes cultural context and references when he writes his letters because he is writing to the Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? Everyone who's not a Jew. And so he is writing and he is saying, particularly to the, to the Greek Gentiles, to the Japhethites, right? And Paul is saying, listen, I know, so for example here, uh, in Europe, right? So you have the Archaic, the Phoenicia, the Ancient Greece. Ancient Greece arose and fell before Christ ever entered. And then you have Rome that was there for that time. So he understands that people in that region, in Europe, are going to have an understanding of the, the Greek philosophers and ideologies, etc. And when he writes, and he goes to uh, Mars Hill, in Rome, and he goes and says, "You, you got a God for this, and a God for that, and you got a God that you don't even know the name of." And you just say, "Hey, just in case we forgot one, you know, here's another God." He's like, "You know what? I know the name of that God." Do they really have that? Yes. Seriously? Yeah. A guy, if you don't know the name of a God. Yeah. Okay. And so they Does he have a name, or that's no? That's the whole joke. You guys know the name? Is it, or? it was just like a catch-all. Okay. In case we missed one. No, but, no, no, no. And so, Paul, and so Paul said, Paul, <laughs> and Paul says, hey, this one here that you say is, you don't know the name of him? I know the name of him. Let me tell you about him. And so he starts witnessing to him. Isn't that cool? So he uses their culture and their context and their references. So I just want us to understand where we're coming from, right? So that's why we're, that's what today is about. We're building that backstop, that stage, that, that platform with which all the action is going to happen with these characters. Here is a, um, a satellite kind of relief imagery of the region as it is today. Now, as you mentioned, Chris, some of this may have changed through the years where it was probably a little greener. I say a little greener. Right. Well, those changed after the flood. That, that was Whoa. that was pre-flood. <clears throat> so yes, everything at one point was wet. <laughs> everything <laughs> during the flood. But as you can see here, this is what we call the Mediterranean uh, climate, and that's where they get one to three feet of rain per year, and they have pretty moderate climate. Uh, you know, they may get into the 90s during the summertime. They get into the maybe 40s and 50s during the winter time. They don't have huge swings. Uh, some people kind of compare this area to maybe California, you know, that kind of deal. Kind of this Mediterranean climate didn't get crazy hot, didn't get crazy cold. Uh, not a lot of rain, but enough to have greenery, uh, but not lush greenery, but just some greenery. Okay, so that's the Mediterranean area here. And the closer you get to the equator in this area, which I'm not going to go into today, the meteorolo meteorological uh, impacts of, of what happens, but effectively there uh, there's something called the Coriolis effect. So if this is the planet here, this is the equator right through here, right? Well, these are not, that's set up way too high and Russia's way too high Africa needs to be lower. and Africa needs to be lower. But anyway, um, <laughs> the equator on this side, let's just ignore that side. The equator's here over on this one, the equator's over here. So anyway, the equator's here and because the earth is spinning, right? And so what you have is what, what you call the Coriolis effect. And that means that these, these currents here are spinning in a clockwise pattern. And these are spinning in a counterclockwise pattern. And when you do that, you bring, you bring moist, warm air from the ocean over this part of the land. And then as it approaches here, it loses all of its moisture and it dries out. And that's why we ended up with this middle land that doesn't have any any vegetation on it. It dries out. The same thing here. When this is coming up this direction, it's depositing um, England, Scotland, Ireland, crazy green, 
right? And that's because the prevailing winds from the Coriolis effect are bringing the moisture here. But then as it, as, as it progresses through, it gets drier and drier and drier. And you can see that here. That's the meteorological side of what we're looking at. Okay. As a matter of fact, the same thing happens over here. Let's just look at this real quick. Okay. So if we have, if we have the, the, the pattern is, is clockwise here and counterclockwise here, right? Clockwise here. Then what happens is, is we have warm, moist currents coming across, across Mexico and they bring moist. This is where our tro tropical systems come. To. Actually, Agatha turned into Alex just recently, right? It just went right through here and it's over here right now. <laughs> so what happens is this moisture is, is spinning clockwise. And so we get this part of the U.S. gets a lot more rain than this part of the U.S. And then when this is count, this is clockwise over here, right? So the Pacific Northwest is getting hammered. They're a temperate rainforest. They get 10 feet of rain per year. But here in this region, nothing. And it's because of the Coriolis effect. It just, it's bringing, does that make sense? They don't get rain in yeah. rain every Hardly any. The Santa Ana's? Is it Santa Ana? Yeah, it's in the wintertime. <coughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, it, it just, that's all snow errors. So, again, we're not going to go into any more than that, but if you didn't know that, now you know that all happened after the flood. That's a very defining line, too. I've actually been in Africa. At the, oh, yeah? Uh, at the uh, equator. Oh, yeah. You can go literally feet from the equator and flush a toilet on the, on the north of the equator, and it'll spin one way, go literally feet on the other side. They actually have bowls. Right back where your buddy's within, 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 within feet of each other. Yeah. And one, you'll just put water in, they'll let it stop or go, and go one way. No, I've seen it. Myself. I've seen it on videos. But yeah, that's that's the Coriolis effect. Okay. I it was the magnetism South Pole, North Pole. Yeah, no, right it's, it's the Coriolis effect, and it is um, is you are you are in a declination. You're at the widest point, so so you're falling, and the Earth is in motion. So. When you're falling and in motion, then you're causing a what we call a torsional vortex. You know what else is interesting? Studying the tides. Yeah, I haven't done that. I'm not a tide guy. Like you're talking about the Earth's magnetic field, the tide. And if you're a fisherman, good fisherman have to know the tide. Correct. Man, it's interesting. So you get you you see we're building the stage, guys. We're getting a context of what where what what where when who and and why. All right, so this is Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8. The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, remember Mount Horeb and Mount uh, Sinai are on the same kind of ridge in uh, the, the Midian, northwest Saudi Arabia. We looked at that uh, during our Exodus study. Lord God said to us at Horeb, you have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go, all, go to all the neighboring peoples in the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev, and along the coast to the land of the Canaanites, and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. <laughs> See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Okay? So, we see all the way to, to Damascus and the Euphrates River, all the way down to the Negev, which is that point that comes down, that point that comes down here um, from Israel. And, and there's actually, they don't have it here, but there's there's the, the Suez branch and then the Sea of Aqaba is right here, if you actually zoomed in. And so that Negev connects at that point and then the Israel comes up and then it makes a kind of a dagger shape, really. So that's that's where they're talking about, okay? This is kind of the shape, generic shape of Israel. Uh, I have this image in our um, Exodus study. They were talking about the 12 tribes. And if you'll remember, um, Dan, who's way up here, that was not Dan's original location. I think we talked about this, but I'll say it again. Dan was supposed to be right here. Original land given to Dan. And Dan was pouty. Because we're right next to the Philistines and we got to fight with them, rubbing elbows with them all the time. We don't want this land. So 
the I don't know whoever was in charge, but they were like, fine, quit being a whiny baby. Here you go. And they moved him all the way across the furthest away from the Philistines. <laughs> that maybe the insight into the tribe of Dan. I don't know enough about I haven't studied the tribes like that. Maybe that's a study that we can do is do the tribes. This is a zoom in of where the most action happens in our study with the apostles. This is not all of Israel. Israel uh, does continue, you know, up here, the, the ancestral land of Israel. The the uh, Damascus Jordan border is, you know, is up here, but now, but it was further up than that in Lebanon um, whenever we saw it in Deuteronomy there. It tells you it was further, but it's not there now. Of course, Jordan's over here on this side of the Jordan River, and Israel runs, you know, from the Jordan River to the ocean. And then this is the, the Dead Sea down here. And there again, it kind of makes a point. What's, I, think, I think I'll show you maybe some of that on there. But effectively, most of the activity in the Apostles' study that we're going to talk about, remember, we're setting the stage, is happening from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea, the river, and around Lake Tiberias, also called the Sea of Galilee, also called Lake Gennesaret. For context, how wide is it from the Jordan to the ocean there? Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 50 miles. Wow. That's really this is going to give you some context here. This is the Sea of Galilee. Which is supposed to be the biggest freshwater lake. In the region, the yeah. Freshwater. Yeah. And from Nazareth, as far as a bird flies, to Capernaum, it's 20 miles. Is that giving you some more context? When, when you hear, oh, you know, they lived in Nazareth and they went to Capernaum. And you're like, man, you know, they got in the car. They bundled the kids up and they gave them like activities to do in the back seat and whatever. They drove for days. It's 20 miles. They, they hiked that in a day. So on the uh, slide before, where is Nazareth in comparison to Sea Galilee? Nazareth is right here. Okay. They hiked 20 miles in a day? Yeah. That's what you can do. So you're yeah. looking at it's a hundred miles from uh, from the Capernaum to Jerusalem. Right. So this is hopefully this is kind of blowing your mind a little bit because you kind of hear these stories and you read this stuff and you're kind of like, oh yeah, it's like Houston and Dallas and Amarillo and whatever, but like they're all right here. It's like Katie and Houston. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is the length of the shoreline of Capernaum or Capernaum. Hans likes to say Capernaum. I say Capernaum. I don't know which way is exactly right. I just say Capernaum or Capernaum. Yeah, you can say Jesus it. Probably isn't Jesus is not upset yeah, for the. Probably, okay, but it's one point six two miles of uh, waterfront. Wow. Good real estate. One point six two miles. Wow. Not much. Not much at all. That's We're looking. People, you know, there's a discrepancy because, you know, the storms. Mm -hmm. They're like, how could the storms be that bad? Or that, you know, well, there's a reason. We're talking about that, actually. <coughs> so from where the, the mouth, where the water empties in the Jordan continues, because the Jordan comes in and the Jordan continues through. This is a natural dam. And from that point right there to the where the river comes in is 13 miles. It's about the same length as Lake Conroe. Yeah. Lake Conroe is 24,000 acres, so I don't know if this would be an acre. It's, it, Lake Conroe has more fingers that go out like that. Yeah. But more shoreline. When, yeah, more shoreline. But when you look at just from the dam. That looks like a bowl. Yeah. Basically. That's like a lot of water. 13 right. miles. All right. From Migdal, which is Lady Mag, uh, Magdalene. She's from that area. Across to the other side right here, which is part of the Decapolis, 7.73 miles. Do you think those shorelines are slightly visible if the possibly Oh, yeah. No, you can see across. Okay. And we're actually going to talk about some of that during the study. Some of the things that Jesus says to the apostles, now that you understand that, you're like, well, that's seven miles. Like, I can see. Yeah, see I can see across. <clears throat> okay. So the perimeter... If you walked, if you hiked the perimeter, it's 33.33 miles. Wow. 
33.33 miles perimeter. Okay. So one third. Uh, 33.33. Third of 100. I guess. Third of 100. Yeah. yeah. But it's, <laughs> so 33 miles. So we're, from where we are right now, we're like 26 miles to downtown Houston. Okay. Do you imagine that? So you, no, that's a, that's more than, I mean, that's a, a really long day of hiking. They're going to do 10 to 15 on an average day. 20 is a pretty good day. 33, you could do it, but 33 would kick your butt. You'd be utterly exhausted. Yeah. But to say, hey, I'm going to go to the other side of the lake, and then I'm going to come back, that's two days. Walking, right? And in, in spring break this year, if you remember, I, I went hiking. I did 100 miles. I did 100 miles. It's 15 miles a day for seven days. Um, about. Um, and so, was it like the day in the 15 miles a day? Is it like a big, hike? well, a big deal or it's a pretty good hike. We did 17 one day and I was, That's what I'm saying. Are, I was, are you beat by that? Or oh okay? yeah. Are you beat, are you worn out? You worn out? Yeah, I was worn out. Now I wasn't like collapse, fall on the ground and immediately fall asleep, but I was just like, all right, I got to start winding down cause I'm kind of done for the day. You know, that kind of a deal. Now. They do this on an everyday basis, though. Yeah, it's a big deal to them. They probably never even had a car. <laughs> yeah, they don't have a car. They don't have, most of them didn't have donkeys or horses to ride. You know, there's no taxi service. There's no Uber. <clears throat> and they're carrying everything. Correct. <laughs> so this is the kind of dagger shape I was showing you. This is where it comes down to the Sea of Aquaba down here. And the Gaza Strip's over here. Uh, this is the Negev Desert. This is Jerusalem, and then you follow that over to um, Jericho is right here. Jordan comes up, and then there's the Sea of Galilee. And then the, the Jordan border uh, is right here. And Jordan kind of wraps around this area, and this is Amman, Jordan over here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Lebanon's up here. Jordan's over here. My bad. I'm sorry. When you look at from the top to the bottom, all the way to this tip down here, that fits inside of this box. <clears throat> All of that fits inside of that like box. Yeah. So, I think for me, whenever I was doing this study, um, it was kind of an eye opener that yeah, I like it, man. it is okay. So the stage is not near as big as I imagined it to be. It's a pretty intimate setting, right? Pretty intimate. You know, about it, they probably design a, uh, what do you call it? You know, when you make a town or something like what we call it. Establish. You can change a town. Think about it. It had to be the walking. A day walking distance. That was probably. Well, and that's why when you're driving up 45, if you didn't notice, look for it now. You go to Conroe. And then you go to Willis, it's about 15 miles. Then you go to Huntsville, it's about 15 miles. You go to, you go to whatever, it's 15 miles. Madisonville, 15 miles. Centerville, 15 miles. Yeah. Like, whatever 15 miles is. Uh, and that's because that's a good day moving day. distance walking. for a day of walking. It's interesting. I just think when those towns were founded, you were walking. Correct. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you said that there was something. Like, we're from Oklahoma, so we did that drive many times. Right. That, you know, from, you know, Houston all the way to you know, right. mid Oklahoma, yeah, you know, definitely go that, that route. You know, I'm talking about that every 15 miles, like a new town. There's something. Yeah. Yep, there's something. And that's why. All right, so you're wrapping your mind around it. On the left here is a breakdown of the vegetative uh, conditions that prevail in an area. Now, that doesn't mean, like, for example, I may have an oak tree in my front yard. You don't have an oak tree in your front yard, okay? That's not an oak tree. He does have a tree, but it's not an oak tree. So I have an oak tree in my front yard. So what we're saying, what I'm saying is like this is indicative of an area, not a house by house example, right? So when you the further north you get, so the mon, mountain vegetation on Mount Hermon, which is the highest point in Israel, um, Mount Hermon has what we would call like um, uh, subalpine vegetation, which is going to be the short, like kind of pineys and stuff like that, right? And then here in this area, you have the Mediterranean woodlands and shrublands, and that's if you imagine Greece, 
with like the little scrub oaks and the olive trees. That's the same stuff you're going to have through here. Again, not every square inch, but just indicative of that area. Then you have this semi-step shrubland. And if you don't know what step means, it just means, uh, have you ever been to Wyoming? No. Okay. If you've not been to Wyoming, you need to go. It's awesome. It's beautiful. Okay. Uh -huh. But it, it's, it, there's no trees. There's no trees. It's kind of rolling I terrain. Get it, the trees? There's no trees. Okay. And there's kind of rolling terrain, and they have this scrub brush that's like this, you know, this kind of height, you know, like this kind of height. And it's different scrubs and, and brush that's out there. And the, the antelope are just all over the place eating on it. There's so. no trees anywhere. There's no trees. Crazy. There's no trees. The whole state? Pretty much. Crazy. But that's that's kind of what this is, semi-step shrubland. So it's, that's kind of the same idea. So if you have, if you need to look that up, you can go look that up. You can look up Israel shrub, you know, step shrublands or whatever. There's another major step, S-T-E-P-P-E, -E, in the world. And it is in... Western Mongolia, southeastern Russia. I've heard about that one. Yeah, and that's where Genghis Khan rolled through there and all that kind of stuff. And it is this kind of just rolling, no trees, just kind of rolling, grassy, shrubby stuff. It's not like the Great Plains here. The Great Plains here, it's very, very flat and it's going to have mostly grass, right? It's not that, it's kind of this shrubbier stuff. Okay, and then down here you've got the shrub steps, and then down here is extreme desert, which is basically rocks and sand. Okay, now there's a coastal plain through here. The coastal plain is not going to be it's not going to be the U.S. Gulf Coast, where it's all grass and trees and beautiful and lush. It's still going to be a Mediterranean style. Okay, so it's going to have more grass with a few pockets of trees here and there. This other one over here, it kind of lines up with this one, the vegetation image, is the annual precipitation. Again, this is modern. They may have had more back then. Okay, I'm willing to admit that. But the annual precipitation, you can see here, you get about two feet of rain up here, and then it starts going lower and lower amounts of rain the further south you go, which kind of makes sense when you think about the vegetation. Okay? <clears throat> Houston, have? Houston gets five feet of rain per year. Five feet of rain per year. So two and a half times the, the most rain that they got over. Correct. The year. Yeah. So when you, when I'm when I'm teaching uh, my my regular job stuff, I say if you'll take a take a dot on Houston, I, I say just. About, okay, it's, it's approximate. Take a dot from Houston and you draw a line straight up to the Canadian border. Everything east of there gets enough rain. You should be able to establish vegetation of some sort. Here west, it's going to be more difficult to do that. Not impossible, but more difficult to do that. The further southwest you go, the way more difficult it's going to be, except for this pocket over here in the Pacific Northwest, which is, again, they've got 10 feet of rain per year. That's the Coriolis effect. But when you look at this, so the reason I'm doing that is when you have a construction site, when you're done with construction, you're supposed to stabilize it, okay? And you're supposed to stabilize it. If you're east of this line, like I could spill seeds on the pavement, really, and get grass to grow on the concrete in Houston. I've seen it happen, okay? The humidity, the rain, the temperatures, whatever. Okay, so basically you have 100% vegetation here. Over here, you start getting varying amounts of vegetation and different types, right? You don't have huge lush tree forest like you do over here, over here. Those, it's gonna be much more shrubby, um, that kind of stuff. So just think about that when you're thinking about, okay, well, yeah, we get a lot more rain over here on this kind of half of the country compared to that half of the country. Well, this was different because the comet was different than two, and there could not have been a painted gardens of Babylon. Correct, yeah. Which is desert right now. It's complete desert right now, that's right. All right, so this is what you were talking about, Chris. A, in Luke 8, it says, A windstorm swooped down on the lake, and they were caught out at sea, and they were sorely afraid. Remember that kind of that from your Bible story days? So the prescription for a windstorm is cool sea breezes. So as the, the ocean is cooling down, remember the, the earth is spinning, right? So as the earth is spinning... The cool air is actually 
kind of hanging out and the earth is moving underneath those cool winds. And so those cool winds are uh, plunging down through these ravines and crashing into the hot air that's baking in the cauldron. This is the deepest place on the planet on the surface. Um, it's 141 feet deep, 8 miles wide, uh, which we already talked about. It's 700 feet below sea level. 700 feet below sea level. So what happens is that cold, What does, does cold air rise or fall? Falls and hot air rises. So this hot boiling air and hot boiling water in this cauldron, whenever this cool air is sinking, because cold air sinks coming off the Mediterranean, it, it doesn't matter how cool. It's relative to what this is, right? So when that cool air comes in, it causes this to cool down rapidly, and that, that causes the turbulence, which causes these major storm events. So there's actually reasons why uh, we see that that happening. Okay? Isaiah 35, 1 through 10, The desert and the parched land will be glad, the wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear, your God will come, and he will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs, and the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there, and it will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast. They will not be found there, but only the redeemed will walk there. And those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. And this is what the people of Israel used to say, our land will be restored. It won't be this desolate desert. God is going to come back and he's going to restore our land. Okay. This is, uh, this is what we call a cross-sectional topographic overview of the um, different soil and sediment and rock layers in Israel. Now this happens to show you the cross section between Jericho and the foothills that lead you out to uh, the Mediterranean. Okay, here is the Dome of the Rock, which is the famous. You know, all the pictures show you the Dome of the Rock. That's not a Jewish or Christian location. That's a Muslim, but that's where that is. Okay, it's kind of at the high point in Jerusalem here. And because of the different water, uh, because of the different soil and rock uh, types that we have present here, if you'll look, you've like this gravel and sand, right? So the gravel and sand, that is going to allow water to flow through it. So what little bit of water we get on the surface ends up permeating through those rocks and it comes out into the river Jericho in little in little springs along along its banks. There are just little springs that pop out. And that's because these layers are exposed um, along the Jordan River. Pretty cool? The other thing to think about is when you're underneath the Temple Mount, there is um, there are some pools that are there for ritual washing. Some of them were, they kind of dug it out and it's just like rock. And so we just pour water into it. Others are actual springs that are fed there. And that's because they were able to find, hey, if we dig down, you know, just to right here, then this water will pop into our little area. So there, when you think about, we think about wells being, we're going to drill down a hundred, you know, to, to a thousand feet and get down to the aquifer down below us. But here, they don't have to go that far. Because the water is. Well, that's one reason why in 87, even the Romans surrounded Jerusalem, they were able to stay, you know, for so long. Right, yeah, because they, they had access to water. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's 100% correct. Cool stuff? Very interesting. All right. This is a artist depiction of what it might look like looking out across Capernaum, 
uh, from the top of your, you know, you woke up in the morning and you're stretching in the morning and you're looking out to the Sea of Galilee. That's kind of what this image is supposed to be looking, okay? So what, what do you notice here? My house is taller than all these other houses. Well, you're maybe up on a hill. You may, up, may you may be up on a hillside, okay? But I, I noticed that there's a boat over here. Well, it's not like um, you know we have the Bubba Gump, you know, shrimp boat that this is huge vessel. Like these things are small, smaller wooden crafts that they would a couple of guys would be able to pick up and take it to the shore. Okay, so they're either repairing or constructing there. Looks like they're working nets in this area here. Um, you can tell they have these flat roofs. There's no restrooms in this artist's depiction, but yes, that's where they would be. They would typically have a restroom on the roof so that so the winds can blow away the smells. No, no. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, there'd be no leak here by construction. Yeah. Well, they'd use a pot. They use a chamber pot up there. But um, a lot of times that's where the restroom would be located. Well, there, the, the, your job would have been to empty the chamber. Yeah. <laughs> Bradford, get the chamber pot. Bradford, get it. <laughs> But there, there, there's the story of King Eglon, which when I covered this previously um, about the bathrooms being on the on the roof, uh, King Eglon he was went up there, and Ehud was the the person sent to pay tribute on behalf of Israel to King Eglon, and he was like, hey, I got I got to tell you something. So he's like, okay, well, I'm I'm gonna go to the restroom, so just hang out. I want to hear what you have to tell me, and. Because that he was waiting for him to get done going to the restroom, his guards were like, yeah, he's going to the bathroom, so whatever. Well, Ehud had snuck in a uh, a big dagger on his on his thigh, and he pulled it out. It's 18 inches deep, 18 inches, a foot and a half, and he stuck it into King Eglon while he's on the <clears throat> chamber pot. And it says literally that he lost the sword inside of the guy because he was so fat. And then he closed the doors, and then left, and and left, and so the people were like, "Well, he's just taking a long time, you know. It's just, he's king's king's really letting it roll up there, you know. He's I don't want to be rude, you know. So they left him there, and Ehud was able to escape because they were just kind of waiting. Man, it's taking a really long time. King, you okay in there? Are you okay? Uh, are you? Oh, and he's dead, you know." And what, what by the night either. <laughs> that was during the the judges, I think. Okay. During the, the reign of the judges. I'll send you a, a link to everybody on the on the group me. Uh, no one caused the death. No one can find the knife. Why the hell yeah. did? What happened? Well, I th I, if I'm not mistaken, the story I think it says his entrails became <clears throat> his extrails. Oh, so, so it became obvious. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. But anyway, so that's why. I, so the the they normally put the restrooms on the roof to so that the vapors. You know, blow away. Um, but what do you notice here? You notice that there is a lower level, and then you see the stairs, and there's kind of this upper level. And this this would actually be like the living room up here. Why? Because it's stinking hot down here. Yeah. So I'm going to come up here where there's a breeze. Okay. And I'm not going to go on the roof because the roof is potty time. But I'm going to go yeah. right on this little balcony area here. Down here at nighttime. That's where you would shuffle in your dogs and your cats and your sheep and your ducks and whatever. You'd shuffle them into there and you'd close them in. Okay. If you have a guest, they didn't have hotels. When, when we hear about the story of Jesus, we say there was no room for them in the inn. That was probably the one inn that was in Bethlehem. And it was probably able to, to keep like two or three families max. It wasn't like the Holiday Inn. It was like a guy who had a couple extra rooms. Okay. So he did say, I don't have any room for you in the inn, which that's probably an over-exaggerated term. We're used to thinking like the Holiday Inn, which is going to have 100 rooms or whatever it is. The inn, mean, because people would, people would request, hey, we're traveling. Can we stay in your lower level? Sure, you can hang out down there. It's good night. We're going to bed. We're going up here. We're going to go to bed. Okay. So this is likely... Um, the area where people would come and stay and you open that up to other people coming because you would utilize that when you went to a different place. Some people are coming to Nazareth, Mary and Joseph would be like, yeah, sure. you Use our bottom, whatever. That's cool. I mean, the, that donkey, he snores loud. So just get used to it, you know, be prepared or whatever it is. 
All right, so, uh, and then we also notice that there are, there's not a lot of vegetation in here, right? And I want to point this out. There's not a lot of, like, straight, you know, if I'm standing right here, there's not a lot of straight, long views. Like, I'm not looking down Luetta for an entire mile, right? Like, there's a lot of jig-jog and all that kind of stuff. And we talked about that previously. The reason that happens is because the father will kind of establish. And then and then when the son gets ready to get married, he's like, hey, will you be my wife? She's like, yes. He's like, all right, sweet, I'll, I'll be back. I'll be back. And so six months, 12 months, a year and a half, two years, however long later, little Bubba would add, would add on, you know, an additional, that's maybe what they were doing here. He's going to add on so little Bubba can get married. And that's where he and his wife would stay. And so, no zoning laws, what you say. No zoning laws. And so then when, whenever that place was ready, then he would say, all right, I'm back. Let's go. It's ready for us. And so that's what they said, the same thing. Jesus goes to prepare a place for us. And when it's ready, he's going to come back for us. And that's what that's talking about. It's talking about this idea that they're just kind of adding on these hodgepodge. So there's no straight alleyways, okay? It's, it's all... Zigzag. Okay. If you notice over here, they've got some fish. They're drying them out on the roof, hoping the cat doesn't eat too many. Um, so it's a very kind of functional place. There's a, not a lot of, um, you know, there's not a lot of decoration. There's, there's no paint job on these things. It's just very utilitarian. Okay. Very simple lives. This is a view from. Mount Tiberius towards Capernaum, which is over here in the distance. Okay, so Mount Tiberius is where um, Herod's son was building a palace over in this area. And so, anyway, the Mount Tiberius is kind of this mountain that's all around the edge. It's the southwest side of the Sea of Galilee. And so, this is the western bank, and then it turns, and then and then Capernaum is going to be in this this kind of area over in here, just outside of our kind of not very clear vision, but you can see the other side. It's not like super clear, but you can kind of see the other, you can see the other shore. You can see the other shore over here and there's kind of some hills back in here. So it's not like, you're not, you're not going to be like, oh, look, there's Bobby walking down the shore. You know, that's not going to be the case, but it's there. It's ever present there. Okay. You can see it from the distance. And this is looking on that same, on the other side of that mountain, looking towards where the Sea of Galilee empties out into the Jordan River right here. That's where the, the, the water exits out of the Sea of Galilee into the river again. The south end? The south end. So this is the mountain that's at the southwest corner. So that first picture was looking that direction. This picture is looking this direction. And that's literally 100, no, 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 I'm sorry. That's, that's how many miles? 20? 33 miles around. Okay. 33 miles around. Thirteen miles. Seven across. Right. Yep. This is a typical uh, Sea of Galilee fishing vessel. They're still using this today. Again, it's not a tiny ship. It's not like that one. Uh, but they they're pretty decent size. But they're not ginormous. It's not the Bubba Gump, you know, shrimp trawler or anything like that. This is going to take four to five guys to crew these things. And in the scriptures, which we'll, we'll talk about when we get start getting into the apostles the next few weeks, right? Um, we'll talk about, you know, how they worked these things together. It was in the mud. Yeah, yeah. Oops. It looks like about 12 feet, 13, 14 feet. I don't know. Yeah. It's not real big. It's not huge. But remember, the average height of a man back then was 5'4". Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Six of us would fill a boat up, but back then it would, you know, you had a whole boat. Yeah. Four and crazy, but yeah, six of us. <laughs> <laughs> This is just outside of Capernaum. Um, they they have some shepherding that happens there. It's not really a shepherd intense area because this land is better used for agriculture. They're going to grow more crops here. But this is what a even today this is what a flock and shepherds look like. I mean, they're sheep, just two guys standing around, right? So 
not rocket science there. This is a kind of a recreation of what a carpenter shop might look like. Uh, I've talked about this before. I don't claim that Jesus was a carpenter. I don't claim he wasn't a carpenter. The word in the Bible is tecton. And that means it's skilled laborer. Craftsman. I don't, I don't know. He could, have been a, what I he could be a stonemason. He could be a general contractor. Well, he's more than I am. He, 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 he could be a, a worker. Yeah. Doing what he's got to do. yeah, he could be a carpenter. He can, Or he could be all those things. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. So I don't claim to know one way or another what he is. I think uh, contextually when the Europeans saw the word tecton it said, and, and they translated the word to a skilled craftsman or worker of materials, then they probably said, well, what does that look like in our culture? Well, in Europe, you had plenty of forests, and so things are made of wood. When you look here, there's not a lot of stuff being made or constructed out of wood in Israel. The houses, when we saw those houses earlier, how many woods did you see in those? It's all It's all rock. Yeah, yeah, and stone. Out, yeah. So it's not impossible, but it's less likely that he was a pure carpenter than he was someone who probably worked with some wood and also did a lot of stone stuff. Know from Saul, it's typically the only trees that you can get were shipped in from Lebanon. That's correct. The cedars of Lebanon. Yep, the cedars. That's correct. Yep, of any size. The rest are all scrub yeah, scrub trees. The wood, though, like for furniture, was made for royals. Correct. So the Greek word is tecton? Tecton. T-E-K-T-O-N. The wood that the altar was made of was acacia wood? Acacia wood. wood. Was that around here? That's, no, that's down. That's actually down in that area. Uh, of, not part of Israel. That's no. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's in okay. south. It's in uh, northwestern Saudi Arabia in that part of the world. There are some other acacias that are around, but not in Israel. Yes. Israel's not an acacia. Okay. So, yeah, that, he specifically said, I want you to come to this mountain to worship me. And then you're going to use materials that I've got ready for you here, along with what you bring out of Egypt, right? Good call. This is looking kind of, not from the shore, but the shore is behind us. Looking towards, the, you can tell they're, they're planting agriculture I told you about. And then it gets Mount rocky and mountain again. And then it'll come back down and go to the Mediterranean on the other side, 40 to 50 miles away. Not huge. Not huge. Okay. So when I say, hey... You know, Jesus, are you coming to launch? Like, you could, you could see, right? You could see th- this is not a huge area. As a matter of fact, um, the population of Capernaum, 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 however you want to pronounce it, during this time was likely, from our best guesstimates, 1,500 to 2,500 people. Klein High School this year had like 4,500 students. Yeah, I know, like my graduating class was nine years ago, that was a thousand kids at least. I don't think we were a thousand people graduating class. How, how is that possible that then because the Israelites when they moved there already were over or close to a million, right? Right, but that's just, just Capernaum, but you've got Nazareth, you've got Bethsaida, yeah, you've got it's not that big of Chorazin. There, but each town only has 2,500 people, it takes a lot of people to be a million divided by 2500. Jerusalem is where everybody is wanting to be. Uh, okay. Jerusalem is huge. Okay. I think there was hundreds of thousands of people yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. This sense. is backwater Israel. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, in Jerusalem at this time, there was uh, just inside the gates, there's over 30, about 30,000 that live inside the gates. Yeah, and then there's all people all the all Yeah, I think, I think really around. But no, this is, this is a backwater. Gotcha. Okay. It would be like New Guinea. <laughs> Yeah, this is a this is a cutaway view. Remember, I explained to you the lower floors where the animals and storage and kitchen, and then you would go to the you know a a work area, sleep area situation up here. This is kind of a cutaway view of that same thing that I've already explained to you. All right, any questions on this? Okay, I covered that already. The Hasmonians or the Has Um effectively the line of the priesthood was passed down from Aaron to his sons and his sons to their sons, etc., etc. At some point between the beginning of the Roman Empire and Jesus' birth, 
the lineage of the priesthood got perverted. And effectively, some people nudged their ways in and bought their way in to that lineage. And that's part of what the Hasmoneans are doing here. So this is just a, a, a I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but there, there is um, some, some odd things that are happening. And we're not going to cover all that now. But just know, when you get all the way down here, you've got Herod the Great. And that's the Herod who said, Jesus, you, the Magi, you're telling me there was a new king of Israel? Okay, well, all the babies in in Bethlehem, kill them. They said it would be better to be uh, Herod's dog. Son. So, so he that's... Isn't the gospel called him King Herod or something? Yeah, or something like that? yeah it's King well, Herod. Yeah. yeah. But that Herod the Great. And they call him the Great because he was a... He learned how to work the people, and he did a lot of public works type stuff. Yeah, the Herodium, the Temple Mount. He expanded the Temple Mount. But he was put up. He was made king by the Romans. Correct. But if you. Yeah, like when I learned. That's right. But if if you look, but this guy here was the high priest, and he is related to marriage to Herod the Great. Herod was not. Jewish. His mom, he was half. He was half. He's half Jewish. His mom was from Saudi Arabia. So, so my whole deal is I'm not I'm not going into a whole a whole deal with you guys here. I'm just simply pointing out that there's other things besides the architecture of what's happening there, the agriculture that's happening there, the vegetation, the temperatures, the rainfall, the geography, the geology. There's also this stuff happening in the background. Politics. Politics. Right? Family drama. <laughs> Family drama. This is, uh, we talked about this during our uh, Easter series, but this is, you know, from Bethany to Bethpage, then they took this, this is where the, the triumphal entry, where they laid down the palm branches and the clothes and all that kind of stuff for him to walk on. And you're thinking like, oh man, the triumphal entry, this must have been like this grand procession, like when the, when the Astros won the World Series and we had the streets of, you know, Houston filled up. Well, really, this is this is only about a mile. This is not like a huge parade route. I mean, I mean, I guess a mile is a mile, but it, you know, you, the, our context, our understanding of this, it really shrinks down. We don't have big trucks filling up the mile, right? It's just donkeys and people. Correct. So yeah. You need, need a lot less space than when you're running semis or. That's true. Down That's true, and this is that that route that I just showed you. This is when you get to the top of the hill in Bethpage, you're looking towards the Temple Mount, which is this is the, the Dome of the Rock, which is on the Temple Mount right now. That's looking that direction. This is what it looks like. So Jesus would have likely taken, uh, he would have gone down to the Kidron Valley, and then he would have come up into the East Gate, which let me see on this image here. Where is the East Gate? Oh, East Gate's not even on here. It's over here. The East Gate's actually over here. So he would have gone up like this and into the East Gate right there. That's bricked in now. Right? It's bricked in. Because the people who are in charge of the Temple Mount right now read our Bible incompletely. <laughs> and they said, oh, the, the coming Messiah is going to come in through the East Gate. Well, we'll, we'll just brick it up. He had, already, he had already come in through the East Gate, though. So, but uh, we're not going to get into that today. But that, yes, you're right. This is a, they have in Israel a mock-up, a scale mock-up of what the city looked like during the time of Jesus. And this is what the scale mock-up looks like of the Temple Mount. Herod, the temple originally was, was just this area kind of right in here, okay? And Herod, this is the East Gate, this is where, the, this is where Jesus would have come in here, okay? Uh, this is where the Dome of the Rock is right now, right over here. It's not on here because this is a, a, a mock-up model of first century, okay? And this is the temple. And the temple mount, you can see here, it has this kind of Roman colonnade around the edge. And this thing down here was kind of an open pavilion, a big open pavilion. And this was called Solomon's Portico over here. This is where, when it says that they gathered at the temple and they, they sang worship songs and they, they did that. They weren't in here. They were in here. This is where they were. They were in here um, because they not hardly any of them could actually gain entrance into that, into the temple area itself. They were just on the mount and they were in here in, in kind of this big pavilion, which is kind of like a big church, I guess. Okay? In the middle is where the, where the, uh, the, priest, the, the, priest, the ark, 
The Ark of the Covenant, when it was here, was in there. Yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So this is just what it would look like. Herod was in charge when, or Herod was responsible for expanding this and bringing in huge limestone rocks, and they are so precisely uh, worked over that they are like fit together perfectly. You can't even slide a dollar bill in between them. And he built up this whole thing with these huge multi-ton rocks. Um, and he was trying to win over the people's favor, right? So that's that's kind of where we are with, with the Temple Mount. Um, this is an example of Jesus using the term, my disciples, is not a new understanding, okay? There was normally a rabbi, and he would take a a school-age boy who would go through the school, let's call it school, and when they got to a certain age, maybe junior high, say, this person here, uh, like, like, like maybe like, like maybe Gary, you've got some promise. Like, I really see you understand the scriptures on a, on a next level. Um, I'm, I'm going to tap you on the shoulder. I want you to come and study with me. I feel like you can go to the next level. Bradford, you're going to go out to the, sh- to the sheep, man. You're out and you're, you're you know. And, and Jason, you're you're plowing the field, okay? You're you're, you're out of here, okay? So the, the 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 rabbi would choose his students, his disciples, okay? Why are you gonna be a shepherd like Jesus then? Just to the sheep, right? <laughs> so what we see in the story is Jesus selecting the apostles. What he was doing was he was taking the rejects. They weren't in a rabbinical system. They weren't in a a, a Jewish seminary. They weren't in a rabbi school. There was a reason why. And there's a reason why. I don't know what all the reasons were, but we'll talk about what we think some of them are as we go through the next series you know, of weeks together. But what we see is Jesus using that same model of, hey, Peter, I know you got your foot in your mouth about half the time and you're a hothead. Come on, come with me. And Andrew, I, you were like, we're so close to being a follower of the rabbi, but like it didn't work out for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe Peter said, no, I need you here working with me or whatever, but come with me too. Come on. And so I, we're going to see that as we, as we uncover the apostles, the next few weeks, Jesus taking each of them and calling them. And it's matching this system, but he is bucking the system because he's pulling out the ones that the rabbis didn't feel were were worthy of their time okay so the religious elite were were creating were continuing to impart their knowledge and their energy onto those who they felt were most like them and jesus said you guys are nothing like me but i'm gonna choose you 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 okay so you're getting this idea that these disciples these apostles are called out for Jesus, okay? Luke 2, 41 through 50, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. And after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. And you're like, wait a minute, you left the kid behind? I mean, home alone. yeah, home alone, the lost in Jerusalem, <laughs> you know, like, but really, <laughs> you don't go by yourself. It's a hundred mile journey. It, it takes a week to go from Nazareth down to Jerusalem. So you're there with all your neighbors. You're there with your cousin and whatever. And y'all are all just, you know, the kids are running around. You're like, whatever. Y'all good? All right. And don't, don't bother me unless you got a broken bone or something bleeding. Okay. Y'all go have fun. And like. And yeah, and so you're just kind of marching along as you go. And there was a couple of days passed by, and they're like, hey, uh, Mary, have you seen Jesus anywhere nearby? Have you seen him? I haven't seen him. I thought he was over there with, you know, Susie, you know. Let me go. Susie, have you seen Jesus? He wasn't with us. I thought he was with you guys. Oh, man. We're, where's our kids? I'm sure they went through everybody in their little, their little troop, right, and realized, uh-oh. So here we go, verse 44. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Okay, Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. It's not bad, it's not bad parents, okay? Let's just not, let's not go there. But I mean, they did lose him for a couple of days. Okay, <laughs> After three days, they found him in the temple courts. 
sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, I'm sure it was just as polite as this, son, why have you treated us like this? (laughs) The translation, I think, is lost there. It's really, what? (laughs) Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. I mean, I don't think that that was probably the yeah, exact yeah. words, but that's, 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 not to say in the Bible, maybe. that's the that, this is the difference between a word for word translation and an idea for an idea translation. The idea was she kind of what are you doing, man? But probably word for word, we can't put those in here. Okay, <laughs> why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's? Oh, what a smart aleck remark, right? I mean, it's so true because God is his father, but. It's also kind of a like, what do you what do you mean? You didn't know where I was. I'm in my father's house over here, you know. Kind of smart aleck, you know. But it did it wasn't sin, so Jesus got away with smart smart mouth and his mom a little bit. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. All right, so um, let's see here. This is a, a a quick breakdown for you. This is the first five books of the Bible, which is the Pentateuch. That's the Hebrew Torah. They call that the law. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then the next section will be your early prophets. And that would be your Nebium Rashonim. That's the early prophets. And then later prophets are all these guys here. And that would be the Nebium Aharonim. And then you have the uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Solomon. And then you have the stories of Daniel, uh, Ezra, Esther, Ruth, all that stuff. And that's the Ketubim, the writings. This Old Testament here is the Tanakh, and that's the Hebrew's Bible. So if you go to a Hebrew person's house, and they're practicing Hebrew, they'll have the Tanakh. So when you open it up, you're like, hey, I got that, I got that, I got that, I got that. But how, they're going to have all this stuff. What they won't have starts in Matthew. I got a question before we got on this off topic, but how come some characters or whatever in the Bible are called minor prophets. What does that mean? Because if you're in the Bible, how minor are you? Know I mean? Come on. Minor prophets are ones who have less writing okay. from them or about them okay. versus others who have a major role because they have more talked about them. Some are given more duties or more responsibility to them. Yeah. Okay. You would have been so in modern day just as it was back then they would have school and you can see their their yarmulkes on their head these young men and they are being taught by a rabbi which is still the tradition today they are learning the tanakh tanakh and the tanakh is the our old testament they are learning it. They would know it inside and outside. If you had said, uh, you know, um, my, the Lord is my shepherd, they'd be like, Psalm 23. Boom. Like, they would know the Old Testament. They go all the way up to Malachi. Mm-hmm. They still had the training, right? Um, and so there's this idea that Jesus is going to be training them for three years. His time with them for 24 hours a day for seven days a week becomes their seminary, becomes their schooling, okay? And he's teaching them a new way. We'll talk about some of that later. The Septuagint, just if you don't know what that is, means 70, sept, right? Sept means seven, which is odd because September is our ninth month of the year, but yeah. that's, that's because our Roman, our calendar is jacked they, up. I thought they fixed it back in the year or whatever, 300. They fixed the calendar, didn't they? They fixed the, they fixed the year. They fixed the year, they didn't fix the... <laughs> Yeah. So, but anyway, it means 70. So they took 70 like highly intellectual, highly trained translators and they took the Tanakh from the Hebrew and the Aramaic and they translated the whole thing into Greek. And that's what the Septuagint is. Okay. It's the first translation of any part of the Bible. This Old Testament was translated into New Testament, Koine Greek. Greek was the language of the world at the time. Translation was done in 3rd century BC, 285 years before Christ. About 70 Jews skilled linguists were sent from Jerusalem to Egypt to undertake the translation. Why do you think they went to Egypt? It's probably where uh, 
Oh, there's probably libraries and resources. Yeah, exactly. That's where you went to get done, right? You were the epicenter of art. That's right. Yeah, that's where you went to get done. The library of Alexandria, yeah. right? Yeah. So many Old Testament quotations in the New Testament are from the Septuagint. So when we're, when, we, when you're reading the New Testament, and he says, remember, it was written, blah, 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 blah. That's a Septuagint translation. So Jesus, I use the modern English version, and I brought my, uh, I brought my uh, ESV Greek Hebrew Study Bible here as well, but I use the MEV for my my regular reading stuff. But these translations they exist now. They didn't exist in Jesus' time. Jesus' time, what they read, the scroll that they unrolled, and the King James, right? <laughs> the King's English. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it was the Septuagint. That's what they had. When uh, Alexander the Great conquered the Holy Land, I mean, I'm sorry, conquered Egypt, the first, they didn't call them pharaohs then, but the first king that Alexander the Great put in control of Egypt was Greek by the name of Ptolemy. You've heard of the Ptolemy? Yeah, Ptolemy. Right? Ptolemy, yeah. So that, he was Greek. So he was the first uh, Egyptian king that spoke Greek. Yep. <clears throat> so the version. Alexander the Great is the reason that Westerners know. Is the reason crucifixion is from the east originally? Alexander the Great brought it to the west, and that's what led to Christ. You know, when you heard Alexander the Great is the, the guy that brought that west. Well, Alexander the Great was before Christ. Well, yeah, I'm saying, but he brought crucifixion to the west. That's why. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. He the culture. Yeah, the yeah, culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he, yeah. He found it in the Persia or whatever, and he brought it. The over. Hellenistic culture. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The Greek culture. Yeah, yeah. So this is the version that was used during the life of Jesus, and it was the version that the apostles used, the Septuagint. Okay, just a small fact, cool to know. So you know, you now know what version of the Bible the, the apostles carried with them. The they didn't carry it. There was there was not copies like the that. Scrolls. The scrolls. Okay. Um, and then, master, in Hebrew is rabbi. In Greek, it's didaskalos, which is a little bit fun to say. Disciple is talmid. And in Greek, it's mathetis. Now, mathematics is the study of studying. Study of studying. Arithmetic is actually the word for what we think about, 4 plus 4 or whatever. But we've just changed it over time. But mathematics is the study of studying. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a learner. I'm a studier. I'm a mathetes. I'm a disciple. I'm a learner. But arithmetic is actually arithmetic is actually the four plus four, the number stuff. But we've just, again, we just use stuff like here in in Texas. We say, hey, you want a coke? Like, oh yeah, sure. I got Sprite, Dr yeah, Pepper. Yeah, exactly. you know, <laughs> what did you say yesterday? I asked once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so same kind of idea. We use mathematics now to mean math, you know, arithmetic. But it's really arithmetic is the the word. All right, and then this is um, a ruins of a synagogue in Chorazin, which is if you have the if you have the the, the lake, you know, let's say that Africa was this lake, the Capernaum's right here, right up in here, in between, basically in between Bethsaida, which is where Peter and Andrew are from, and Capernaum is a little place called Chorazin. It's mentioned a couple of times in the Bible. This is the synagogue that they uncovered the ruins of there. Likely, Jesus actually read from the scriptures or even taught in the synagogue. It's pretty cool. Okay? This is what it looks like. It's not fancy. Okay? I'm going to go back to that. It's not fancy. It's There's no gold ornate. There's no, you know, high polished marble. It was just use the rocks that are around. And this, the synagogue was actually a place that you would go. It was kind of like your VFW hall. Like you could have weddings there, you could have funerals there, you could you could go and get a drink, you can have uh, get-togethers and play dominoes, you know, whatever. Like it was just kind of the meeting place. And on Sabbath, we kind of gussied it up a little bit, and it was our church. But all the other days of the week, it was all the other things. Okay, that was the synagogue. So it was kind of a, a meeting place. Everybody would go to, go on down to the synagogue. What was the name of this town again? Chorazin. Chorazin. Yep. <coughs> And then this is a uh, an image of a Westerner's depiction of what the Last Supper might have looked like. Uh, if you'll notice, they're all sitting down. 
and uh, they're leaning on their left arms. If you'll notice, they're most of them are leaning on their left arms. That, that was the Roman way of eating. Because your left hand's your dirty hand, so you lean on this one because you're not really using it. So then you can eat with this hand or drink with this hand, right? Um, and if you weren't here for the Passover event that we had, which is fine, you do that next uh, time. Yeah, you were. Um, Jesus, the, the place of honor in this setup is actually this spot right here. This A Westerner who doesn't know that did this art, this depiction, and that's why Jesus is there in the middle. That's what we think in the West. Right here. Okay, okay. That's right. Because remember, it says, I'm going to dip into the dip with Judas Iscariot. So that means Judas has got to be here or here. And then it says, Peter was across and yelled over to John, Psst, John, ask Jesus, who's the one who's going to betray him? Would you, would you ask him? And it says, John leaned back onto Jesus and asked him. So who, who can lean back onto Jesus but this guy, if Jesus is in the place of honor? So then that means the third spot was Judas, Judas Iscariot. And what makes that the, honor, the honorable position? Well, Judas was the I don't know. That's just culturally their place of honor. For us, it's not. The second person from the corner. Uh -huh. like that thing. Okay. I don't know why. But when you know that, the story makes more sense. Okay. All right. That is the introduction. We have set the stage for... Let me go back. Where's the, where's the beginning here? Nope. Widen out. Seriously? All right, here we go. All right, so comments, questions, complaints. What do you what do you think now that we have the stage set for well, I like, I like how you got the monitor there. That helps. Yeah. Well, on something like this, I don't know how else you would do it except for to be able to show, you know, the images there. Yeah. So we're going to start going through. Some of the guys will have a whole week to themselves. Some of them will share a week with somebody else because there's just less information about them. And there will be one or two weeks where we're going to have a whole bunch of them squeezed in because we just don't, all, don't know a lot about them. I watched YouTube and there's like four of them that we, we basically know their first name. That's all that's did. Correct. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> now, some of it, and Chris, Chris will have some, some extra stuff to bring in too, but some of it's like, as tradition goes, this person left and went to so and so, or as tradition goes, this person you know, had, had their you know had their ears ripped off and yeah. they shoved up their nose and they couldn't breathe anymore or whatever. I mean, that didn't actually happen, but <laughs> that'd be a terrible way to die, though. All right, so I am glad you're here. I hope you'll join us through the rest of the summer series as we do, do, deal with the fourteen apostles. See you next time.